If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Sophie Barrington and Archie Creative are the experts in equine marketing and Sophie understands how to achieve success in the horse industry, providing innovative and outcome-driven marketing services that result in a dramatic difference to your bottom line. Go to horsechats.com, search for Sophie, search for Barrington or search for Archer Creative to find out a little bit more about equine business marketing. Today's guest is Dr. Robert Miller, and happy to have Dr. Robert Miller back again. We had him a little while ago, and today he's going to talk to us about the 10 behavioral characteristics of the horse. I think he's very well qualified to talk about this, and you'll find out a little bit more about his previous chat with us on number 437. So just go to chat number 437 and find out a bit more and then come along and find out more today about the 10 behavioural characteristics of the horse. How are you today, Bob? Fine, thank you. Uh, Look, good to talk to you again. Now, this 10 behavioural characteristics of the horse, I know you're well qualified about it and I know that you've talked about it before and you've actually got a book that's got this included, and we'll talk about the book and what you're doing there a little bit. But why this subject today? Is there a particular reason why you even started to study this subject and put it together? Yes. Uh, While the horse has been my my primary uh, interest, uh, I've actually worked with every possible creature. I was a zoo veterinarian throughout Mm -hmm. my career and worked with uh, every possible exotic animal, including dolphins and whales. Uh, I worked with livestock, pets, dogs, cats, birds, everything. (laughs) And it was the fact that I'd only been trained in six species, six domestic species, that made me have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of research, a lot of study, ask a lot of questions. And I finally realized that in order to understand any creature including horses and including humans. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand the process of evolution and how nature equipped each species to survive in its natural environment, its primitive environment. And uh, since I work more with horses than with any other animal, I was able to uh, come up with these 10 qualities of behavior unique to the horse, and anybody that works with horses professionally or recreationally in order to do it effectively and safely and efficiently, they have to understand these 10 qualities. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. No, that's good. That's good. And I think, you know, a professional's training right through to, you know, first horse owner or just starting, um, I think really good education for them. So, Can we start with the first one? Now, I've got them, so I'll go through them. Then if you're happy to talk about them, the first one we've got is the secret of flight. Yes. Uh, Each species has several methods of defending itself, uh, but there's always a primary method of defense. And so when you look at the anatomy of an animal, the secret to understanding its primary defense is in its anatomy. So, for example, if we look at a member of the dog family, wolf and so on, the only weapon we see are the large fangs. And we correctly assume that that's primary defense. Uh, Look at a hedgehog or porcupine. Uh, Their anatomy is a clue to primary defense. Now, there's also secondary defense and tertiary defense. Uh, We look at uh, cattle, buffalo, uh, the bovine species. They're all prey species. They all have horns. 
and we can correctly assume that the horns are the primary defense. But they may choose to run, a secondary defense, mm -hmm. flight. They may choose to hide, uh, a tertiary defense. So this applies to every single species, including our own, which I'll get to later perhaps. And uh, in the case of the horse, when we look at the horse, here's a prey animal that doesn't have any horns, doesn't have uh, a horn on its nose like a rhinoceros. And we study its anatomy. What we see is an animal whose primary defense is flight. The horse is a sprinter. And the other nine characteristics I'm going to give are all secondary to that primary defense of flight. They're, they all relate to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. The next one is the secret of perception. Yes. In order to run away from danger, you must be uniquely perceptive to see and sense danger. So therefore, the, the horse has the same five senses we do. The sense of vision, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of smell, uh, and the sense of taste. And uh, with the exception of taste, the other four are all involved in flight. When the horse in, in, the, in the wild state hears something, sees something, feels something, smells something, that it is unfamiliar with, its response is to run away from it. It runs what's called flight distance, which is usually slightly farther than the primary predator can run. In the case of zebra, for example, uh, they'll run four to 500 yards because uh, that's the way they outrun the lion. Uh, of course, they're related to the horse. They're a flight creature, too. Yep. So, that's the horse is uniquely perceptive. They see things, hear things, smell things that we humans cannot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this explains, you know, a lot of the time people might say the horse did it for no reason, but if it's able to sense things a lot more that we can't, it's not for no reason. It's just a reason that we don't understand. Exactly. I've heard that happen. I've heard that said thousands of times mm. for no reason. Yep. He started the buck. He, he spun. He ran away. He did this or that. He kicked. Uh, there's always a reason. Mm. And that's, that's so important for us to understand the perceptivity of the horse. Yes. They even need uh, the position of our body, mm -hmm. our position of our hands, the expression on our face. They're yep. so perceptive. Yep. Yep. All right, the next one, number three, is the secret of response time. Yes, if you're going to stay alive by running away, you've got to move very, very <laughs> yes, you have. Yes, yes. The horse has a remarkably fast reaction time, uh, much faster than the human, because we are not a flight species. You know, a house cat can outrun an Olympic sprinter for short distance. We are not. Uh, a flight species. We don't stay alive by running away. Uh, primitive human beings had other methods of defense. But the horse, because it's a flight species, uh, has extremely fast reaction time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we we cringe almost, you know, that the horse can shy so quickly and can react so quickly, but this has helped them through evolution. And if they weren't able to, then we wouldn't be able to enjoy them today. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, of course, one of the reasons they're such a valuable species is because of the qualities we're talking about. Uh, that's why they're effective at the racetrack and they were effective in warfare and hunting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, because of their reaction time, because of their perceptivity and uh, their flightiness. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is the next one, is one that's interesting as far as training horses goes because it's the secret to rapid desensitization. Yes. If, if you're going to stay alive by running away from any stimulus, that you don't are not familiar with any movement, any sound, uh, any feeling, and you're not familiar with it, 
and that's going to stimulate instantaneous flight. So that that's what triggers the the horse's flight. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they have to be able to detect that and respond to it with amazing speed. So it not only makes the horse so useful to us, uh, but it also makes the horse potentially dangerous. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If a, if a creature stays alive by running away from anything that it is not familiar with and knows is not dangerous, mm-hmm. that means it would be running all the time. There would be no time to eat, to drink, or reproduce. Yep. But but the horse. If a stimulus, which is frightening, does not harm it and it's repeated, Mm -hmm. it will desensitize to it where it's absolutely indifferent to it. That's why horses were so useful in warfare, because the sounds of battle, which are terrifying, they soon learned it's terrifying, but it doesn't hurt me. And from now on, I'm just going to ignore it. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what the horse can do. And that's so important in training that as long as it doesn't cause pain, yep. Yep. the horse can be desensitized amazingly rapidly if you present it properly mm-hmm. and causes no pain to the horse, no matter how loud the sound, no matter how frightening the, the visual object. Uh, the horse will desensitize to it and become absolutely indifferent and oblivious to it. And it's one of the great secrets of horse training is that this is possible. Yeah. The reason it's possible, people say, they, oh, that sure must be smart. That has nothing to do with it. Nature has equipped the horse to become very rapidly desensitized to any stimulus as long as it doesn't cause pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, the next one is the secret of learning, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would have thought that once you understand about the secret of desensitization, you can sort of have them hand in hand with the secret of learning. Is that right? You know, do they go together about the desensitization and the learning? Well, yes, that's a learning procedure, is Mm. uh, desensitization. Uh, The technical term is habituation. Okay. Okay. and if presented properly, I want to repeat it, if presented properly, the horse will habituate re- remarkably speed. The problem is that we humans, since we have different qualities of behavior, uh, impatience being one of them, uh, we sometimes cause physical discomfort, pain, uh, in our training procedure, and that is a negative effect on the horse. Mm-hmm. Now, also, some traditional human methods of training horses uh, picked up on this. So, uh, for example, uh, in the American West, the cowboy uh, method of starting horses includes what they call sacking out. Mm -hmm. And that is confining the horse where it can't run away. It's in a small pen or it's uh, on a halter, tied and uh, immobilized. And you, you wave a blanket over its back. Well, at first, it's terrified. It thinks it's going to die. Mm. And you do it again and again and again and again. And somewhere, if if it's presented properly and causes no pain, somewhere between 30 and 50 of uh, those stimuli with the waving blanket, the horse will start to relax and eventually will become in, absolutely indifferent to it. And they never forget that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's it's a, a part of horse training that's very important to understand. Yep. That when we present anything new to the horse, it should be done gently and repetitiously mm-hmm. and not cause physical discomfort, pain of any kind. Yep. So if we can talk a little bit more about this secret of learning. So you've got the, um, you know, habituation, but but what about teaching? Because I can understand that when, you know, when they're introduced to a new experience, that it should be a kind experience, a kind where they're not not hurt in any way. What about the novel experiences that they have? Well, the popular, most popular term, at least in our society, in training horses in a gentle and effective way is to say pressure and release. 
-hmm. you cause pressure, and then you release it to reward the horse. Uh, I prefer the term comfort and discomfort because comfort can be severe or just very slight, and discomfort can be severe or very slight. So I, I think if we think in terms of comfort and discomfort, we can much more effectively understand how to train the horse. So uh, to give you an example of teaching a, a green horse to pick up its foot, so you can work on the foot. Obviously, a lot of people use forceful methods, uh, but it does, it's not necessary. You can just cause slight pressure in the uh that lock area until the horse picks up the foot, and that's discomfort. It's not pain, but it's dis- discomfort. Mm-hmm. And then the instantly, instantly reward by re- removing the pressure, giving the horse comfort. Not a bit, lot of comfort. It's not like a food treat, yep. uh, but it's uh, but it's comfort, and it's just a question of time before the horse. When the fetlock is pinched, picks up the foot. Mm-hmm. Now, does that apply to all four feet? No. Each foot has to be separately handled and trained because the horse cannot use the power of reason that we have and say, well, it doesn't hurt on the left forefoot. I guess it won't hurt on the right forefoot. That's human reason. Yep. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And, you know, I'm trying to work out why some trainers are really good with this and some trainers aren't, but if they've got a thorough understanding of these, you know, the behavioral characteristics, then that's going to make them a better trainer. Yes, and as I say, because we respond in a different way, uh, our primary defense is different. Uh, mm-hmm. We're a different species, uh, and we use this the methods that are natural to us. They're sometimes very unnatural to the horse. Yep. So we have to learn. We have to learn to speak the horse's language. Uh, so, many, so much horsemanship is brutal and unnecessarily uh, aggressive. Mm-hmm. And the, the horse uh, does not, what his brain says is run away. Yep. Uh, but the horse is also a highly adaptive animal. And so these methods work. They're a very forgiving creature. Mm. Uh, having seen horsemanship all over the world, I've seen some excellent things and I've seen some horrifying things. Okay. And uh, that's because the horse is a forgiving creature. And even though we can use terrible methods, the, ho- the majority of horses learn. Okay. Okay. What about the memory? We've got number six is the secret of memory. What can we learn about a horse's memory? Yes, it's the best, the best of all domestic animals. Mm-hmm. If you're going to stay alive in the wild by running away uh, from unfamiliar, frightening stimuli, and conversely, completely ignoring those you've become habituated to, uh, have learned through repetition that they're harmless, even though they sound bad, look bad, uh, you learn that they're harmless, and you don't, you just ignore them. Mm-hmm. That's it. Uh, I'll give you an example that I have seen in Africa. Please. Yep. I've seen a pride of lions lying in repose in the midday sun, just resting, and a herd of zebras a little over 100 yards away. Uh, grazing. Mm-hmm. Complete. They know the lions are there. Yep. Then one lion gets up and stretches. They all the zebra pay attention. The lion walks away casually in the opposite direction. The zebra go back to grazing. But if the lion stares at them, crouches and stares, off they go. Mm. Mm. That has provided that quality. So. Um, that applies to what we're talking about in the case of the horse, um, the learning. Now, if you learn, I'll give you an example common in the western United States, tumbleweeds. The first time a, a foal sees a tumbleweed rolling before the wind, that's terrifying. They don't understand it. Mm. But eventually, it's part of life, and they absolutely ignore it. 
What if they go to a different location for the next 15 years? Then they brought back and they see a tumbleweed again. Oh, they, the brain says, I remember that. It looks bad. It's scary, but it doesn't hurt me. Okay. They never forget. Horses have an incredible memory. Mm-hmm. They have to have. If you're going to stay alive by running away from danger, you better have a good memory. And those horses that did not have a good memory uh, did not survive to reproduce. Yes. Okay. Okay. What about short-term memory? Is that as good as the long-term memory? You know, like they remember something years later, like a tumbleweed, that it's not going to hurt them. But but short-term memory, I've heard that's a little different. Is it different or they can remember? Just It, it all depends upon the speed of learning. Okay. Yes, the, the, the short-term memory is as good, but they, it's a question of the speed of learning mm-hmm. and how it's presented. So much in horsemanship, the, of the first experience, is frightening. Yep. Uh, for example, sometimes it's the first time a halter put it on a horse, a halter. Uh, the horse is frightened, mm-hmm. unfamiliar. It looks strange. It feels strange. And the human responds by putting pressure on the horse, causing discomfort. Uh, the horse will never forget that. Now, you can overcome it. That's what we do mostly with horses. We overcome bad behaviors, but we shouldn't have established those bad behaviors in the first place. Okay. If we went up things properly. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. What can we do then to stop the bad behavior? You know, like because things like a farrier, you know, a farrier can be good or bad, a dentist, a vet, different examinations. What can we do? You know, horses can be touchy around the ears or touchy around the flanks. Is yes. that because they've had bad experiences and they remember them? The bad experience doesn't mean pain necessarily. As I mm-hmm. said, if you take a horse that's not been handled yep. and you take his face abruptly, it's uncomfortable. It's mm-hmm. not painful. Okay. Uncomfortable. And But if you, if instead of abruptly touching, if you... Move slowly. Allow the horse to touch you first. Then smell your hand mm-hmm. until relaxation occurs. Yep. Then gently touch. Then you can slowly slide your horse towards his uh, eye or towards the ear. Yep. Along the neck, and, and gradually desensitize, habituate. As I said, is a technical term. Okay. And uh, as a veterinarian. So much of what we do is uncomfortable to the horse. Uh, But I found that using this technique, Mm -hmm. I could teach horses to accept uh, all kinds of procedures. Can I give you an example? Oh, absolutely. Yes, please. Yeah, for example, uh, I I was going to say tube worming, but that's that's obsolete now. Uh, We don't worm the horses that way anymore. Uh, let's talk about floating the teeth, something that often has to be done annually with many horses. What I would do is I would take um, first with my hand and teach the horse that I can rub under your upper lip, which is a pleasant sensation to the horse, then the gum, then touch his tongue, just gently stroking with my finger. I I put a a few drops of honey or syrup on my finger. Mm -hmm. And that scared me, but you know what? It tastes good. So they're used to it. Then I take the float and I put a little syrup or honey on the float and I present it to the horse's mouth gently, very gently. Finally, I go back to the molar teeth. Once he's accepting it, I go back to the molar teeth and I don't use the blade of the float. I use the back of the float and gently stroke the teeth. Now, it's still psychologically uncomfortable, but horses like to be stroked and they like the taste of the sweetness. 
So after several minutes, it depends on the temperament of the horse. This can take two minutes or ten minutes. So sure. the horse, I can tell by his facial expression and his head position, says, that scared me, but I like it. Mm-hmm. And once he likes it, I turn the float over and gently start to float the teeth ever so gently. This whole thing may take me 20 or 30 minutes. You say, well, how can you can't get paid for float at taking that time? No, that's true. But if I'm going to be doing that horse annually for the next 20 years, yes, it's going to pay off. The last day of my practice that I retired, one of my calls was at a warm blood stable where I, well, I didn't slow feet, but I used the same method for, for warming, passing a stomach tube up or the nostril. I used the same method of training. Mm-hmm. It may take me 20 minutes to teach the horse that, that I'll not hurt you and this is not uncomfortable. Uh, but I went to the warm blood stable that I've been treating uh, for years, the horses there, and I tube wormed 98 big warm blood horses without using a twitch mm-hmm. and without tranquilizing a single horse. Yes. I had one horse that just come in from New England, and I did have to tranquilize that horse. Mm-hmm. But I did 98 horses. Uh, that paid off for the time I took years earlier training the horse. It helped build my practice. People appreciated the fact that I didn't charge for the training period. I was doing it myself. I would often ask, uh, it, are you keeping this horse? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We yes. Body. But if they said no, no, uh, um, he's going to uh, the other part of the country, uh, then I wouldn't take the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I couldn't afford to. Sure. But it, it uh, greatly enhanced my practice, and uh, I actually enjoy working with horses like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Is there anything else we need to talk about the secret of memory or we'll move on to the secret of dominance hierarchy? You can move on, but before, let me just say that sure. some of my videos show the, this procedure. Yes. How I start a horse, get a horse used to a tube going up its nose mm-hmm. or a a dental float into its mouth, and so Now, injections, they always cause pain. Mm-hmm. But uh, so you can't tell the horse that this is not going to hurt, because it does. But there are other methods, uh, that I, and I show those in my videos, uh, uh, but you, uh, you can't do it with injections. So okay. uh, what's next? Uh, we're going to talk about the secret of dominance hierarchy. Yes, creatures that live in groups. Yep. Not all creatures do. Some animals are primarily uh, loners. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, with the exception of the African lion, most cats are loners. That doesn't mean they can't get along with their own kind, but they don't need them to survive in the wild. So most cats are basically loners, except, of course, when they're mating or uh, reproduction, Mm -hmm. with the exception of the African lion, which is a herd creature, a pack, I should say. Okay. Uh, So herd creatures include all members of the horse family, the zebras, donkeys, horses. It includes dogs. Uh, It includes the relatives of the dog, the primitive relative, the wolf, uh, the coyote. Uh, These are all group creatures, and so are we. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there's a few hermits around that want to be alone, but they're the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. Humans, if you study primitive human culture, uh, we are definitely group creatures. So that's true of the horse. Now, group creatures have different ways of communicating and as establishing the order, the hierarchy, it's called the dominant hierarchy. Who, who is in charge and who is the follower? Who's the leader and who's the follower? And each species is completely different how that's accomplished. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about horses. Horses establish their dominance hierarchy, that is their order of leadership, by control of movement of the feet. The feet are the primary defense in the horse. 
And so if you watch yearlings uh, play fighting, uh, you'll see that they rear up and they paw at each other. And then they reach down and try to bite the, the legs. Okay. Uh, yep. What are they saying? I take your feet away from you. <laughs> you lose the ability to run away. I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need me. And this is true to uh, almost every creature that I have worked with. Is that uh, so? To use an analogy, the dog primary defense is the, the teeth. The dog who is submissive lays down, expo rolls over, exposes abdomen, saying, in effect, go ahead, kill me. I won't defend myself. You're in charge. You're the boss. Okay. okay. So when we control movement in the horse, that's how we establish our role as a leader to the horse and not as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And if you think about horsemanship, the use of hobbles, uh, putting horses in chutes, confining horses, uh, just tying them up, but could put, using round pens for training where they can't run in a straight line away from us, that controls the horse's mind and establishes our, our role mm -hmm. uh, as a potential leader. Okay. Okay. Now, you talked, you know, when we did the secret of dominance hierarchy, about control of movement when you talked about the yearlings, you know, and um, is there anything else there to say that's number eight, the secret of control of movement? Well, uh, we humans have uh, many methods of controlling movement in the mm -hmm. horse. One is confinement in a very small space. Uh, we have uh, training methods, the Western United States, the traditional cowboy method of uh, Tying up one hind leg, we call it a Scotch hobble. Mm -hmm. Tying up hind leg, or hobbling front feet, or the methods that were made famous by horsemen, uh, like in uh, John Rary, uh, in previous centuries, uh, the Ohio uh, horseman, who eventually went to England and uh, uh, performed his horsemanship for the Queen. Uh, his method uh, was the use of a hobble, tying up one front leg, making it a three-legged horse. And the horse's mental attitude is, I've lost a leg. I cannot defend myself. I'm going to die if a predator shows up. I need help. And the only thing to help him there is John standing in front of me. Mm. has an enormous psychological effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Too much... Now, you're familiar with the natural horsemanship movement here. It's, sure. It's, yep. yep. Yes. Yes. Um, the, so much of that natural horsemanship movement involves simply control of movement. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, putting the horse on the lounge line, for example, but round and round and round. Mm -hmm. uh, controlled flight. That's, that's prohibiting blind, straightaway flight from the horse and establishing our dominance over the, over the horse. Mm -hmm. It's just one example. Yep, yep, yep. So, so if we're talking about control of movement, I suppose that's also the lateral work as well? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Hold control yeah. of the hindquarters, yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If we effectively teach the horse to respond, uh, move where we say, when we say it, uh, and the and the rate of movement, how the speed of movement uh, is under our control. Mm -hmm. uh, that establishes our dominance on the horse. Yep. The word dominance, unfortunately, is often interpreted as cruelty or aggressiveness. It's not necessarily true, because throughout history there have been cruel dominant leaders, Genghis Khan. Adolf Hitler, and so on and on. And conversely, there have been powerfully dominant individuals who taught gentle kindness. Jesus Christ is an example. Mm -hmm. So dominance does not require aggressiveness and cruelty. Yep, yep, okay. The secret of body language now. Yes, each species 
has its own language, and obviously mm -hmm. it's different from the language that we use. Yes. And if we want to get along with another creature, we better understand its language. I, working with horses since I was 15 years of age, I was a veterinarian for many years until the natural horse movement began. Uh, started by Tom Dorrance mm -hmm. in the northwestern United States and picked up by people, knew many people, like uh, Pat Pirelli, who took it to Australia. Yep. And, yes, we have to understand the horse's body language. Uh, so, for example, I knew from childhood when a horse lays its ears back, that's yes. an aggressive. Yes. As, as, but I was middle-aged before I learned from... Um, Ray Hunt, Tom mm -hmm. Dorrance, Pat Pirelli, that the horse's licking and chewing is a sign of understanding and acceptance. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know it. Nobody mm -hmm. told me. Yep. And I didn't put it together. And uh, I realize now that that's a very important thing for us to understand, mm -hmm. that when the horse licks and chews in response to our training efforts, uh, that is favorable. Mm, mm. Yes, you can see why it's so important for anyone to learn the body language of a horse and all the signals that they give, you know, and the ones that are unique to horses. Yes, absolutely. Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us. Horse chats at horsechats.com and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right. Look, the last one we've got is um, the secret of precocity. Yes. The horse is a precocial species. That means it is born uh, with all of its senses working. Mm -hmm. It can see, hear, smell, okay. feel, just as it can when it's mature. Yep. And its learning capacity is not only as effective as when it's older, but in some regards, it's most effective right at birth. Those are precocial species, most characteristic of uh, flight species, uh, 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 of uh, prey species is what I meant to say, yep. prey species. So, for example, it was... Uh, the term imprinting was coined by Conrad Lorenz, an Austrian scientist in 1935, working with geese. Geese are prey species. Uh, so are chickens, turkeys, quail. By contrast, hawks, owls, and eagles are predatory species. They are hunters. Uh, the prey species, they're young. When they come out of the egg in the case of birds, are precocial. They instantly see mother, they instantly latch on to her, are immediately programmed to follow her and trust her because that's their best chance to survive. And so in the case of geese or swan or ducks, they will even follow her into the water okay. as precocial species. Now, in the case of mammals, we're talking about prey species, cattle, sheep, goats, Yep. Uh, horses. Uh, prey species would be cats and dogs, for mm -hmm. example. Yes. We are a predatory species. Mm -hmm. Our babies are not precocial. They're completely dependent on mother. Yep. She has to defend them, and their learning capacity is extremely limited. Mm -hmm. it, it grows the older they get, the better it gets. That's very different from the horse, who is precocial. Uh, yep. I don't know if I have time to tell you the incident that uh, made me keenly aware of this. I think tell us now that you've started. I think you tell us. Yes, please. Okay. I was in my, between my third and fourth year of veterinary school, the year before I graduated. I worked for ranches every summer, worked mm -hmm. with horses, because that's what I like to do. Yep. And I was coming in at the end of the day uh, down a cliff. And uh, a steep trail. And off in the distance, out on the flats, I saw six Mustangs, wild horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
as I picked my way down this steep thing, they deep were unaware of me because the wind was coming towards me, so they could not hear me or smell me. And I was too far away for them even to really see me. Yep. And then I saw one mare, obviously in advanced pregnancy, leave the others and go towards the bottom of that steep hill I was coming down. Mm -hmm. And she lay down, and I stopped my horse. And I suspected she was going to go into labor. I, I had worked with foals, newborn foals, as a vet, as yep. a vet student, mm -hmm. and uh, worked as a ranch and farm hand. But I had never seen a foal actually born. So I stopped to watch. And I saw the mare go into labor. About 20 minutes later, the foal came out. Eventually, she stood up, started to lick the foal. I paid attention to it. The afterbirth dropped out. And then I realized the sun had gone down and it was getting dark. Mm -hmm. I had to get home, uh, back to the ranch headquarters. And I, besides, I was ready for dinner. So <laughs> I started back down the trail. Mm -hmm. Well, she heard me first. She looked, looked with anxiety up and down the trail. Then she saw me. And her response, unfamiliar stimulus, was instantaneous flight back to the other five horses. Yep. The foal, which was standing, was still in a very wobbly state. And I, my first reaction is, she's leaving the foal behind. Mm -hmm. but the foal had an instantaneous adrenaline reaction and took off, in wow. not, not keeping pace with mm -hmm. the mare, which it mm -hmm. could do by the second day, but bouncing, bounce, bump. Boom, just bouncing along and keeping right alongside the mare. Mm -hmm. And I thought, isn't that amazing? It's only about 20 minutes of age, and it can actually keep up with mother. Wow. Uh, many years later, uh, I never forgot that, but it made me appreciate the precocity of the yes. horse. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Before we start to talk about your book, which will, I know covers the subjects in a lot more depth, but imprinting, you know, just go over the imprinting and, and how soon it should be done and what we can do here. Well, the, the imprinting period mm -hmm. is the period of time that the baby, whatever creature we're talking about, uh, sees who's caring for it, mm -hmm. usually the mother. Yeah. But it, it doesn't have to be the mother. In the case of uh, the man who coined the term imprinting, Conrad Lorenz, in Austria uh, in 1935, he was dealing with uh, with geese and uh, didn't realize at that time that it applies to mammals as well. Mm -hmm. But social species that are born, uh, that as soon as they see what moves around them, they instantly lock on to it, follow it, and trust it. Okay. Now, most of the time, it's mother, whether it's a goose or a mare. It's mother, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. I've actually seen foals imprinted on a tractor because as, as the foal came out of the mare, a tractor went right past its nose. Mm -hmm. And it, this was a ranch in Argentina. Yeah, They had 13... Uh, tractors on the ranch, and only that tractor, <laughs> the foal would follow it and nicker when it heard the end. Wow, wow. It was imprinted. Yeah. Uh, I learned that by handling the foal properly, proper handling, which I can't get into here, but I've done both a book and video on this procedure. We can get you back another time to talk about that if you'd like. That would be really good. Yeah, I'll be glad mm. to. But I have, uh, I did my own foals once I uh, learned about this. I did my own foals uh, for three years, and uh, then I introduced it into my practice. And um, when I get called call to do what's called a postpartum exam on a newborn foal, mm -hmm. they were often not sometimes as old, as old as ten or twelve hours because I was busy. Sure. But uh, sometimes I was there uh, within an hour. And uh, uh, I would uh, handle that foal. Uh, I won't go into the details, but I, I, being a veterinarian, I concentrated on uh, future desensitization to make, a, make that foal a good patient. Mm -hmm. I 
had 100% success with it with my own foals and then with my clients' foals. And then I wrote some articles for Western Horseman magazine. And uh, eventually they wanted me to do a book on it. And the book started, it's, it's available in half a dozen languages now. And uh, the method is now in use all over the world, although not by everybody by any means. But it met with uh, tremendous resistance uh, at first because it was not traditional yes. to work and, uh, with newborn foals. But everybody that's tried it and done it properly gets great results. So uh, the the opposition has, has faded away the last few years. Okay. But I went through a lot of criticism back in the 50s and 60s uh, with this method. But anybody that's tried it and done it properly knows that it's one of the most effective things that you can do. So I've uh, raised mules as well as horses, and my mules are, I'm, uh, at 91 years of age, I'm uh, riding a uh, 31-year-old mule that was born here. I imprint trained, and uh, she is absolutely as close that to... Well. Uh, <laughs> That's great. And what they call bomb proof. There's yes. no such thing as a completely bomb proof e- equine, but she's as close to it as they come. Yeah. I can yeah. do anything with her. That's good. Very good. Very good. Now, yeah, just, tried. yeah, yeah, just going back to this, you know, just understanding horses and, and the behavioral characteristics. If people would like to know a bit more, because we've just touched on each of the 10 today. How can they find out a bit more about getting the book that's got a lot more information in? How can they contact you? Yeah, well, uh, www.robertmmiller.com. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. Robertmmiller.com. You can get all the information you need out of that. Sure. Uh, done... Uh, Actually, three books on imprint training and three videos, but I only recommend uh, uh, one of each because I learned a lot as I went through the years. Okay, okay, okay. And those details also will be on horsechats.com slash Robert Miller or else horsechats.com slash Robert Miller too. And we'll have all those contact details about how you can contact Dr. Robert Miller and how you can get a bit more information from his wealth of information, you know, he's been been a vet and been working with horses majority of his vet life and, you know, he's speaking, he's lecturing, he's he's just doing everything, writing books, getting DVDs, and I'm sure you'll be able to get some more knowledge from him if, you, if you'd like to contact him about that. All right, so thank you again, and I think we already decided on a, you know, a topic for the next time, so we'd love to see you again and look forward to catching up again soon. Well, thank you very much. I hope what I said will help some of the the people uh, who were. I'm sure that everyone will find a a lot of information about that, for sure. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.